Another day, another video. I think we're about to learn about the wonders of containers. I say wonders. Imagine a box with everything your app needs to run. And I don't just mean your code and its libraries, I mean the OS too. All pre-configured to run as soon as you deploy it. That sounds like a VM if it's got the operating system inside of it, but okay. That's a container. They're lightning fast, portable, yet isolated environments that you can create in mere moments. And after this video, you're going to wonder how you ever developed and deployed applications without them. But that's just a VM. Uh, no. Real. Firstly, please sit down. Secondly, no, I'm not sitting. quite. Okay, it's true that both give you an isolated environment where you can run an OS, but containers are quite a bit quicker to spin up and typically less resource intensive. If there was a scale with VMs on one side and normal native applications on the other, containers would sit somewhere in the middle. Virtual machines are pretty much just tricked by the host hypervisor layer into thinking they're actually running on real hardware. Containers, on the other hand, are more friendly with the host system and just emulate a minimal file system while piggybacking resources by sharing the host's kernel. Right. But if you're sharing the host's kernel, you're not shipping an operating system in the container. You're shipping, I guess, the, the user space of your, whatever, we'll continue. The kernel is the, no, not that kernel. Eh, close enough. The kernel is the core of any operating system. It's the bridge between what the software asks for and what the hardware actually does. It's That's not true because your CPU does stuff all the time directly on behest from your program. This is, um, as somebody who writes operating systems, this is a misnomer because actually when you're being productive or you're doing something interesting, 99% of the interesting stuff your program does, it does directly with the hardware, aka the CPU and memory. When you go to disk, you do an OS call, but um, you know that's a little bit arbitrary that you have to do that. It, it's certainly not where anything interesting is happening, worthy of having this focus on like, oh, the OS is providing powerful abstractions over the hardware, that's not true responsible for all sorts of critical low-level tasks like CPU and memory management, device I.O. You don't... I guess you manage memory, but you don't really man... Okay. This is a simplified video or simplified explanation. I will we'll give this the benefit of the doubt. You know, noobs don't actually know, need to know what's going on. File systems and This is not management. misinformation per se. So how does this all help us as developers? Well, now that we have an OS at our fingertips, trademark, we can work in several different environments at once without having to really compromise anything on our local machine. For example, we can maintain an old app using the OS and package dependencies it was originally built on top of, while also being able to use bleeding edge tech for our next multi-million dollar project without having to worry about any conflicts in doing so. We're also now able to put an end to the it works on my machine problem which is a pretty common phrase to hear in the tech. This is a problem that exists, so, you know, it's legit so far. Industry, unfortunately. Because a container is essentially a full OS at its core, you can be sure that wherever it runs, you're going to get the exact same environment, whether it's on your colleague's machine, your server machine, or somewhere in the cloud. Now we've got the basics out of the way. Let I, f I feel like that... There was a misnomer there. Ever it runs, you're going to get the exact same environment. That is true, you're getting the exact same environment. But the fundamental problem here is you depending on your environment. It's because you have all these dependencies on your program. You have essentially external libraries that you don't carry with you. And then you can't run on on another system. I mean, the classic version of this is oh i can't run minecraft on this machine because it doesn't have java installed and i need java java is a dependency that must be on the system 
um, to run my program. If you're making native programs, like the same way to do this would just be to put all the dependencies in the program, like in the file of the program, just carry your dependencies. Whether it's on your colleague's machine, your server machine, or somewhere in the cloud. Now we've got the basics out of the way. Let's see how we can make a container of our own. The first thing we're going to need is a container platform. This will give us all the tools we need to create and run our container. And for this video, I'll be using Docker, just because it's the most well supported. All containers run from a base file system and some metadata presented to us as a container in. Which allegedly is a full OS. So remember that, guys, a full OS. An operating system is like just it's a few files. What are these files? Oh, they're the thing. They're like parts of my program, actually, that are outside of my program. So I need to then wrap the whole thing in an image and call that my program, except now it's a container. But really, it's just my program. Image. And the way container images work is kind of fascinating because they are formed with overlapping layers. Here's a banana to kind of badly demonstrate this idea. Okay, so in the context of a file system, I mean that instead of changing data at its source, file changes are tracked by their differences to the previous layer and then composed together to achieve the final system state. It's somewhat similar to how source control tracks changes in your code. This concept is really powerful for containers because it lets us extend our custom image from any previous image or image layer there's loads of pre-made and officially supported base images out there, but you can match to your project's core requirements and then add your own packages, code, and configuration. This is cool in that it does solve, given, okay, let's ignore that what the real solution would have been. Given the fake human solution of, I'm in this environment and I have to ship something, this is actually a pretty cool real world solution the thing it's solving is, oh my god, our solution is to ship this huge stack of bloat as our program. And it's, in many cases, you know, could be, for a simple, pro my simple program is hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes or something, uh, which is insane. But let's ignore that for a second. That's the state I'm in. Oh, but look, we have this cool like diffing stacking technology where we can improve efficiency by realizing that, oh, this piece of bloat and this piece of bloat is is uh, shared across many applications. So we can deduplicate and then we have this like layer stack sandwich um, that we use to to like, it's essentially compression, right? This is a form of compression where we compress all our applications against each other so they can share bloat when uh, when that's a possibility. To do this in Docker, we add the commands we want to execute to a file called a Docker file. Docker will execute each command in sequence and then add each generated change to the final image as a new file system layer or a metadata layer. We can run as many containers as we like from a single image. We can do this because when a container is first created, the image's file system is extended with a new file system layer completely dedicated to that container. This means that we can make any runtime changes we like and it won't affect other containers using that same image. What's more, this new layer will persist until we delete the container. So we can stop and start them as we like without losing any data. We can even enter our running containers like we do with a VM. With Linux containers, for example, we can start a shell prompt when executing it, giving us access to the environment to explore and kind of just play around with as we please. Communication between containers is usually pretty simple as well, as most runtimes virtualize a network layer for you. When our app is ready to be published into the world, we're going to want to tag it with something unique, like a v Let's go back here. Our running containers like we do with a VM. With Linux containers, for example, we can start a shell prompt when executing it. This may be true, but it's so much less convenient for basic things like, wait, how do I debug my program? 
How do I run it inside the debugger? How do I run it inside the profiler? These things become hideously difficult to do compared to like, oh wait, imagine if my program like was an executable, like a file that the kernel ran as like a self-contained program. If that were true, then I could run it inside the debugger by just saying debugger here's the file and then I could like press F5 in the debugger to run the program again and again that would be so useful somebody should invent this for docker containers I'm sure it would be a hit giving us access to the environment to explore and kind of just play around with as we please communication between containers is usually pretty simple as well as most runtimes virtualize a network layer for you when our app is ready to be published into the world, we're going to want to tag it with something unique, like a version, so that we can reference it again later. We can then publish it to something called a container registry, which is just like an online storage warehouse. This is the craziness where the default we've decided on is you're always running code that you downloaded randomly off of the internet. And so the registry the function the registry is providing is giving you a way to, <laughs> to to put your software on the web so that other people can download it and run it without much questions. Which is more convenient, but um, this easily, I think, degenerates into like you know, your workflow being oh, I build the Docker image locally, then I, I, I've had to do this. I build the Docker image locally, then I upload it to Docker Hub, whatever. Then, oh, then I can like have the test bench pull that image and it can get replicated on the Kubernetes cluster. And your turnaround time becomes very big because I'm like going out to the network every time versus... I had a program and I could run it on my machine. You know, I've heard some people talk about these things like for certain web companies. I guess George Hotz was talking about this when he interned at Twitter for a while. Is he was saying like, guys, guys, you need to be able to run Twitter, all of Twitter on a laptop. And he's very right. Because you need to, you want to be able to run your full program end to end your entire system locally on one machine so that you could test it, do end-to-end -end testing. Uh, because that's the only way to be productive is you need to you need to be able to hold the product in your hands, so to speak, and um, and rapidly rebuild it so you can figure the stuff out. For our images. By default, Docker assumes that you're using the official Docker registry. However, this can be easily overridden if you wish to use another. When it comes to deployment, many modern cloud platforms have built-in support for deploying containers as standalone units. Do they have built-in methods for me to deploy unexecutable? They don't. And that's, that's the real problem. Alternatively, you can install a compatible container runtime on whatever machine you want to use and pull your image from the registry you pushed to earlier. It does require... Fun fact, so if I build a Serenum cloud, uh, like a cloud version of my own operating system at some point to run servers, and then maybe other people could run stuff on there, then this is how it would work. It would be you upload unexecutable, and then it runs under the operating system. Because we actually support that, because we have... Now, the reason you, you can't do this for, like, a... Linux binary or something is that it's there's no security whatsoever. Um, so you the container here is actually just providing sandboxing so that the uh, so that the thing can be run. Although I bet on a cloud platform it would probably be, you know, it's like sandboxed and then inside a VM or something. Um, but the Serenum cloud could run just executables that get uploaded and then they talk to like a little manager thing. So you can um, get logs back from your server that's running. Units. 
Alternatively, you can install a compatible container runtime on whatever machine you want to use and pull your image from the registry you pushed to earlier. It does require a few more steps doing it this way, but you generally get better value for money and quite a bit more control. If you want to go even deeper, container orchestration platforms such as Kubernetes essentially allow you to create your own container-based cloud. You describe the desired state of your deployment declaratively and let Kubernetes handle the details of how to get there. I actually have no problem at all with this part of the software because this is ostensibly doing a job uh, that, I mean, I bet it's more complicated than it needs to be, but if you swapped out these containers for the same thing, which is I just have like a binary blob executable that can run self-contained with some reasonable API, that'd be way more efficient and you'd save so much money. Um, if you had something like Kubernetes that whose job it was to spin up a bunch of these executables on lots of machines, um, that seems still perfectly reasonable with me. And that's it. Oh, um, I'd really love to make these videos full time for you all. And with enough support, that might just be possible. Yeah, I guess you should go to this guy's Patreon. Thank you. And I'll see you next time. I'll put the link in the description to this guy's Patreon. Um, even though I strongly disagree with this video, I guess the problem is that it's not, it's not misinforming you. It's just giving you the wrong perspective holistically it's sort of this video is like a here you go i'll get you the noob up to date with the copium all the rest of us are on and you know with that copium you'll be able to successfully operate in the environment that we've created which is this hideous mess but you you need the copium in order to uh, to be able to work in this crazy town um, if you want to learn more about the non-crazy town I'm building, I mentioned a little bit this like potentially cooler Docker container stuff, is we have here at samhsmith.com slash serenum, you can go read about the operating system computer that I make. Uh, the latest release now has a window manager. It like looks cool like this uh, in real life. Everything is written from scratch. That's cool. Check it out. There'll be a link for that in the description as well. Have a nice day, people.